the whole time. Yeah, it'll be the only time when you're not, not responding to questions from Carol and Lee. Um, so let me just open by saying a, a word about Janet Topolsky. She, she uh, created and, and runs uh, the Community Strategies Group at, uh, at the Aspen Institute and has done so for, I think, 26 years? 26 years. Uh, you, Although I didn't create it. You didn't create it? No, Susan Seckler created it. She did. I know Susan, and I should have given her credit right. then. Right. <laughs> um, so I'll say a word about her program, but let me just say that when I, when I first came to the Institute 11 years ago, I think the happiest discovery for me was Janet and her program. Um, she was, and you'll maybe see that today, fairly low-key. She, she, she is, uh, and, and she was usually out in the field. She was usually out working uh, with rural communities. So when you saw her, it was, a, it was a special treat. But what was most striking about her is that she combined sort of deep, wonderful values with extraordinary insight. And that combination is what makes her effective, but it also makes her a, a wonderful human being. Um, the program, to sort of quickly describe it, is all about economic development in rural communities. It takes what, what uh, design people call a human sector uh, centered approach. That is to say, it's about local communities um, either identifying or creating uh, strategies for economic development and then uh, exporting them, getting, you know, uh, helping, spreading, spreading the word um, and getting it done. The, um, what you will um, not see, uh, actually what you will definitely see on um, the resume of Janet Topolsky and here in any conversation is that she's from Detroit. She'll work that in. I'm dealing with it first so you don't need to, but she probably will work with it. And I'm from the again. city of Detroit, yeah. not from the suburbs of Detroit. That's right. Uh, <laughs> the real I'm proud deal. of it. <laughs> the real deal. Um, what's not on her resume is that she religiously watches The Voice on television, and whenever I can do it with her, I do too. Um, she also sings every week in the St. Uh, Augustine um, uh, Gospel Choir in, in Washington, D.C. Um, so I was trying to egg her on uh, with the, the music last night. So, you know, well, I was singing, us... but saying, what's the most well-known gospel song is not an easy answer. <laughs> you, you so know. she comes up with me and Bobby McGee. I, mean, I, didn't, like... I didn't come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> and I so, know who did. Yeah, I do too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, my first question of you is, what is the problem you're, 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 you and your program are, are working to solve? Mm. Well, I think the way I would put it is we're trying to work with leaders at the community level. So, I mean, we're another program at the Aspen Institute, and the Aspen Institute convenes leaders, your leaders. Uh, often the leaders that the Institute will convene in a lot of its work are leaders sort of at the national level, whatever level. Our real focus is people on the ground. I mean, uh, there's, there's a politician well known in uh, the United States uh, by people of a certain age who said all politics is local, right? Does anyone know who said that? Daniel Patrick Moynihan, was that right? Yeah. And so I would say that all, all change really happens at the local level. It's not just all politics. And so, so the leaders who get the least attention and are most appreciative of attention and help and thinking and whatever are the people who have to make decisions at the local level about their local economies and their people and their challenges and their opportunities. And so our focus is really helping to connect equip and inspire leaders at the local level who are trying to really improve prosperity in their communities and help people on the economic margins get ahead at the same time, simultaneously, right? So it's not just going in and helping a community build, you know, whatever it wants to build. It's sort of like how can low-income people, places, and firms be part of that action, part of the decision-making and part of the beneficiaries of the action. So it's a different, it's looking at the outcomes of economic development as different than simply profit and return on investment, right? It's, you know, where should the return, what is development really if it doesn't include everybody, mm -hmm. right? 
And, and so you're really describing the people, the people you seek to serve as the problem solvers themselves. Yes. Um, Megan mentioned to me last night that there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about rural populations, what they value, what they think, what they feel, um, and that much of that is, is, is perpetrated by the media uh, generally, which of course is urban-based, uh, the national media. Do you agree? And yes. if so, what are those misconceptions? <laughs> What, what is, what is well, the story being know, told and what's the right story? I, I thought about this because we talked about it a little bit and I said, well, you know, if I were going to say, what, what do I really think, you know, what are the, some of the biggest challenges? And I wrote some notes, so if I look at them, you know, mm -hmm. I want to make sure I say the right thing and also have the right numbers for you. The misperceptions about rural among both urban and rural people, right, primarily urban, but also there are misperceptions about rural among rural people as well are really part of the problem we're facing in this country today when it comes to division. And, and you know, I think probably not just in this country, but I, I'm, most of our work is in the United States, so that's why I'm focused on that. But I think a lot of this stuff transfers. Um, I think, uh, you know, actually we have a lot to learn from the, the developing world about how to do development here. Um, but the misperceptions have to do with who actually lives there, right? So let me ask you, what, what percentage of, of our population lives in rural America? Any wild guesses? 35? 20? 20? Any other guesses? 4%? Four. Four See, so we've got a little range there, right? 35, 24. It, now, the, here we get into one of the immediate problems for rural America, which is there's no clear definition of rural America. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the Department of Agriculture itself has 15 different definitions, but the primary that you've got U.S. Census, which says uh, anything that's not classified as urban is rural. So it's a negative definition. You know, if you're not urban, then you're rural. And that's how it got named, actually. And then there's an OMB, Office of Management Budget definition. But the, the census definition, and I know this is the real number because it was a new New York Times crossword puzzle a few months ago. <laughs> and the answer was, the, the, the question or the clue was 19.1% of America lives there, right? So 20, 20 wins. Now, by the OMB definition, it's 14 point some percent, but it doesn't much matter. And it really doesn't, you know, I can go to the definitions for a long time and people have, you know, spent whole weeks on that. It doesn't matter. The point is, it's about a fifth of the country, right? And if, if you said, if you had five children, you say, well, they all matter except that one, right? <laughs> it doesn't quite work. I mean, it happens sometimes, but it doesn't quite work. So, so it's who lives there. And so what percentage of that rural population do you think is people of color? 20. Any other thoughts? 10. 10? Yeah. Half? It's 21%. Right? <laughs> so Jane wins on this one. <laughs> but it's 50%, 54% of Native Americans live in rural America, which I, you know, there are some people here who knew that. And also, you know, the patterns vary. But there, the growth in rural America, and by the way, rural America, oh, that's another question. Is rural America growing or not growing? Everyone thinks it's just emptying out, don't they? Isn't that what you hear all the time? People are just leaving? It's not true. In every state in this nation, you have rural counties that are growing and rural counties that are not growing. And in fact, the raw numbers in 2016 to 2018, I think uh, in raw numbers, there's 11% more people living in rural than there were you know, two years before. I mean, you know, it's, you just, not, not in two years, I'm sorry, that's in a decade. But I mean, we just don't think about that. And there are counties now that are growing. So uh, everyone. But are just, they growing due to immigration? Or well, I was about to say. So 37 percent from 2010 to 2016, 37 percent of rural's overall growth was due to immigrants. What's the percentage? 37 percent of overall rural population growth, and and this is not just. And most of you will know this, but I'm going to say it. A lot of people think this is just Latinx people. Right, and it's not. It's people from all over the world. I can name, I can start now and name towns all over the country that have 12 to 15 to 20 languages in their grade schools. Wow. Because refugees from all over the world, a lot of them when they settle in the United States are going to rural places because 
a lot of them will come in through religious organizations and they're, they're brought in into these religious congregation sort of settlements, uh, help sell them in rural Minnesota or Nebraska or wherever. Also, the other reason is a lot of the jobs in rural that have to do with um, meat processing or poultry processing, things like that, attract uh, people here don't want those jobs, so it attracts a lot of immigrants around the country because they can make a living. So, so that's responsible for some of the growth. So part mm -hmm. of the answer to the question is misperception about who lives there. Yep. Yep. Second, I only have three. Oh, good. I have five of something <laughs> else, but I only have three of these. The second thing is what happens there. So what industry do you, th I'm going to give you, let's see, I'm going to give you one, two, three, four, six choices and I want you to put them in order of what wow. industry employs the most rural people. What's the biggest employer, not necessarily the biggest economic engine, but the biggest employer, right? So I'm going to give you, well, yeah, you want to just yell, so who, what, what industry employs the most rural people? Fracking. What? Fracking? <laughs> Fracking. Agriculture? Any other guesses? Excuse me, what? You're shaking your head. Oh, you know, it's not agriculture. What do you think it would be then? Well, probably social services. Social services? Uh huh. huh. Education. 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 Any, anyone else? Prisons. Prisons? Oh. So I'll, I'll give it to you in the correct order health and education, 25%. And that's mainly government. You have to think about that. That's mainly government, health and education. Manufacturing, 22%. Wow. 22%. Yeah. More, uh, a larger percentage of workers in rural work in manufacturing than in urban America. But we don't think of it that way, do we? Even rural people don't. Trade, transport, and utilities, so that would like include energy, 20%. Other is 16%. Other beats out leisure, recreation, tourism, and hospitality, which is 11% and growing. Ag is 5%. Hmm. Hmm. And we still, whenever we think of rural America, we still have this picture of the farm and the cow and the, you know, the, I don't know, hard scrabble, whatever, dirt. But that's not who employs people in rural America, right? So these misperceptions are bad because when you hear national news about rural, it's all about, you know, agriculture and trade. And, you know, you read articles that are always, you know, going onto some farm, not into the factory, or usually, I don't want to say all. And in the South, mining. Right, in the South, mining. Here. Right, mining would be in that, uh, the energy one that yeah. I said, the utilities. So, um, the, I mean, and I think the third thing that people don't get is the interdependence of rural and urban America. That, uh, once again, I said, you know, take 25% or take, take one fifth of your kids and say they don't matter, right? But 95% of our nation's land is in rural America. I, I'm sorry, 97%. 97% of our land is in rural America. Now, the importance of land and air and water to urban America is pretty important. And who stewards that, right? Who takes care of the land and the air and the water? Or who do we leave there to take care of it? Because we all draw on it. So there's interdependence there. There's interdependence in relation to energy, right? Because we, we care deeply about that, which I said, but it's really important. Food. We do, do still grow more of our food in rural America than we do in urban. And obviously, this whole regional local food movement is very dependent on rural-urban interdependence and connections. Um, we also don't think about people, right? Now, how many of you grew up in rural places, right? And are you living in a rural place now? No. And, and so I, I, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just sort of saying we educate a lot of our populace that does everything in America in rural America. And in fact, some, some people have uh, crunched Raj, Raj Chetty's data. Does everyone know who Raj Chetty is? Do you want to explain who Raj Chetty is? No, I'm leaving that to you. Yeah, right. Well, he, he's done big data work on uh, you know, understanding mobility in America. And uh, there's this guy, Bill Bishop, who's looked at Raj's data. And Raj, is at, he's at Harvard, right? Is that where he is? Harvard? Yeah. And someone new. Thank you. And, um, I, and, and has shown that people who are educated in rural America end up doing better in urban America than people who are educated in urban America. Uh, 
Hmm. Now, so what does that mean? That means that, you know, we've got a good education system in rural America that's producing value for all of America, not just for rural America, right? That, and, and that people move. It was so funny today when you were talking about uh, Daughters of the Dust. Why? Why? Why did they leave? And I wanted then to ask you all, how many of you are living in the same place where you grew up? One. <laughs> One. <laughs> One person in this room is living in the place they grew up in. And it is our, our, our benefactor. It, but it's New York. Our benefactor, right? <laughs> and so, is that because you're a New Yorker? He's right? a New Yorker. Well, it's close enough. OK. <laughs> But it's not just rural people who move, urban people move. We all move, right? Because I think as some of what you said, or I heard some of you say, is that you have this sense of something else out there, right? And so rural America is a producer of people and innovation. There's innovation all around rural America. And, and um, Jane knows this. And actually, I talked to one of you who, uh, whose colleague had watched it, but we've been sponsoring a series called America's Rural Opportunity that is doing nothing but highlighting innovation in rural America because everyone thinks all the innovation comes from Silicon Valley and whatever. And those of you who've worked in the developing world sure know there's plenty of innovation in rural places all over the world. Um, the but boss we, is, is nodding his head. Right, Uganda. but we don't. Yeah. You know, it's like those people can't do anything. Those people who live outside of the cities, what are they good for? They're good for us, mm -hmm. all of us. So people is one thing, innovation. And I, I want to mention one other thing, uh, which I think is may or may not be peculiar to this country, but 54% of the recruits in America's military come from rural America. And 24% of our veterans live in rural America. And it's another thing we don't think about. Now, why is that? Because they're looking for opportunity, and there may not be opportunity at home, but it's still true. It doesn't matter almost why. There's interdependence between rural and urban America that we just don't think about and talk about. And so rural America really has, in the last, I don't know, several decades, been left behind. And they've got an attitude about it. Mm. Not all of rural America, but some of it. They've got an attitude about it, and that attitude is well-deserved. Because as things changed a lot, there wasn't a lot of attention paid to what are the options for changing outcomes for rural America. Let's just close the paper mills, let's just close the mines, let's just do this, let's have this major economic restructuring, which there has been. And, uh, you know, we'll throw some mm, worker retraining dollars there and hope they work. You know, that's about it. All right, those are the three things. <laughs> All right, well. Uh, how, how are we doing so far? How are we doing? Um, so, so you touched on a few of these. We, we, spoke at length, and I know Tim knew we, we wouldn't get to the day with, without my citing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but um, we talked about a lot of the ele elements of the Universal Declaration, one of them being a right to education and a right to health care, and you noticed that on the campaign trail, uh, presidential candidates re you know, sort of hitting home this notion that health care is a right, not a privilege. Um, when it comes to rural America, You've already said that something like 20% of, of, of the jobs are in health and education. Um, is rural America being served in those two areas? Let me add a third since you're into threes. Um, also a, a, a right to employment, a right to, uh, a, right to a job. Um, is rural America being served? Is rural America getting what it, what is its right in those three areas? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I think the simple answer is no, but what is right? I would say there are parts of urban America that aren't too, that aren't either. Um, there, you know, when it comes to poverty, all of the poverty statistics, um, poverty is worse in rural America than in urban America as a proportion of population. A larger proportion of rural is poor than urban, which is another thing that a lot of people don't understand. In every person of color designation except Asian, poverty is worse as a proportion of population in rural America than it is in urban America. And we think of all of those issues as an urban problem, primarily. We think of the urban poverty, and most people think of 
the, the sort of Appalachian trope of someone sitting on a couch who's overweight with a, with a remote in their hand. That is not all of poverty in rural America. And I'm not saying that doesn't exist, but it certainly isn't, isn't the norm or isn't, you know, it's as varied as anything. And, you know, in, in, so I'll get back to this. So health outcomes are correlate with poverty, closely with poverty. Yeah. So health is worse in rural, and we all know the opioid epidemic took hold in rural. It's taken hold in urban as well, but it took hold in rural partly because of what I said. There weren't a lot of options, and then, then the drug ended up there, and we can go into long details about how that happened. I mean, with the, with the, the corporate pushing of opioid into, in, into the health system. But once it's there and it's addictive, it's there, and it spreads. Um, diabetes is hard. In, uh, worse in rural America. So you have some health issues that are worse in rural America, but that's largely related to poverty, right. as, it w as it is in urban America. The, the difference is that you don't have as much health care available in rural America, and a lot of our national policies related to the funding of health centers as well as Medicaid, Medicaid expansion, has caused the closing of a lot of rural medical clinics and hospitals. I, I, I didn't write that statistic down, but it's alarming how many hospitals close a year in rural America. And that just sort of, the, the issue of, well, you know, you often will hear, well, why don't people just move? Okay, where? And what if I don't have a reliable vehicle? And who's gonna hire me? And what if I have a dependent Housing. mother? and someone's got to take care of her, and is it going to be cheaper for me to find housing in urban America than it is where I live right now? I mean, it's not necessarily, as you were talking about earlier today, a choice, right? And so what do you do in those situations? So it's really, it, it's, it, there's not a lot, as much attention to it as there needs to be. But, the, you know, I think the bottom line for me on this is that there's, there's a huge move, and it's a, I don't want to say move, there's a huge trend in focusing on equity, especially when you all work for nonprofits, you know funders are really focused on equity, mobility, you know, and, and racial equity as well in this country. But we don't think about that in terms of rural. And you cannot work on equity in this country fairly unless you're working in rural America. And, but, you know, we started naming off the national foundations and looked at what their work on equity was and whether it touched rural America, it would be a little alarming. Yeah. It'd be a little alarming. So um, I don't know if I answered your question, but I did talk. Oh, you a did. Lot. You talked, yeah. okay, and, and you actually answered questions in the process. So thank you for that. You you touched on on policy in a couple of places there. So let me just pick up and and look at not just policies that are geared toward that population, mm -hmm. but policies like the Affordable Care Act, uh, for example, that was geared toward us us all. How how is healthcare financing experienced? I mean, the policy for healthcare financing experienced by rural populations? Well, I'm not sure I'm expert enough to answer that question. Okay. Okay. I, I do know this, that on the Medicaid expansion, so for those of you who don't know, there's a, you know, there's national policy around Medicaid that allowed flexibility at the state level to do Medicaid expansion to larger populations that would include rural, more rural people. And some states have said, yes, we'll do it. I mean, and some won't do it. Uh, you have to match it. You have to match it at the state level. I think that's the way it goes. So some states said, we'll, we'll do it, and some won't. And so in North Carolina, for example, there's a North Carolina Rural Center that actually did a study and, and really calculated county by county the effect that Medi Medicaid expansion would have if they passed it, which they haven't yet. And it's an economic driver. It improves the whole economy, not just health. It doesn't just include improve health. No. It, it's sort of, uh, what's the word I want? Multiplier effect is huge on all kinds of different businesses. So that's one example. So if you talk about healthcare financing itself, I can't, you know, the, the rural hospital thing partly has to do with Medicaid expansion too. Because if you don't do that, there are different, uh, what's the word I want? Reimbursement rates. And the, if you aren't getting the Medicaid reimbursement rates for treating some patients, you have a lot of people there with no ability to pay. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the hospitals can't cover those costs with just the paying customers or just the customers who are insured. And that's partly what makes the business model fall apart. Yep. Yep. 
I'm going to turn to, I, I do think it's interesting that when we discuss national policies, for example, immigration reform, that we don't tend to break it up and say what it means for different localities um, in our country. I live in California. Um, if there's a significant slowdown of immigration, uh, that means our agricultural sector will basically you know, be without, without workers. Uh, Silicon Valley would be without uh, job creators. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but, but we don't tend to look at it regionally. And it'd be interesting to know the impact on, on rural versus, versus urban. Let me, let me ask you about the roles of different segments of society in um, advancing economic development for rural populations, but then turn to what's different about what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so first, I just want to have a sense of, well, you mentioned philanthropy, and here's Richard. Here, what is the role for foundations, and in particular, community foundations? So actually, I just, uh, uh, where is he? I just described what a community foundation was. Yes, at lunch, didn't I? Um, so in this country, so, so there's, there, there are many different tiers of philanthropy, and in this country, we have something that uh, didn't exist like 25 years ago in most of the rest of the world, and now is a growing phenomenon called community foundations. And if I ask the random person on the street what a community foundation is, they can't answer it. And that may include some of you, but probably not most of you, because you've probably run into them. But they're a foundation that's set up in a specific geographic area so that people from that area can give and set up different kinds of funds, some of them endowed and some not endowed. And those funds, though, are all, almost all, generally for the purpose of that geographic area, for people, place, and, and causes in that geographic area. And the difference, the, the interesting thing about community foundations is they're constantly trying to grow new funds and endowment. So they're actually trying to build a permanent asset that is always going to be there for the use of that geographic area. Now, we've done a lot of work since I've been at, at, at the Community Strategy Group with community foundations around the country, and partly because community foundations used to be pretty sleepy. They used to be, a donor would come in and set up like a scholarship fund, right, and they'd fund a scholarship for someone to go away, which didn't make a lot of sense, uh, or they'd set up different kinds of funds to do different kinds of things. But then, about 15 years ago, there was a study done called On the Brink of New Promise, saying that community foundations, their, their competitive advantage in the future is their knowledge of the community. And if I'm a donor and I want to give to some cause in my area, I could set up a commercial gift fund at Fidelity or at Merrill Lynch somewhere, but they don't know anything about my community. But if I set up that fund at a community foundation, they know something. So if I care about solving hunger, they actually have grantees who are doing that work and they may know who's doing the best job and they can advise me. So there are all different kinds of funds set up at community foundations. But, but 15 years ago, this study came out that basically said your competitive advantage is your knowledge of the community and you, community foundations, your goal is being to, it will be to take on the most critical issues in your community and act on them because that's what will bring people around. And so there's this movement in the community foundation field called the community leadership movement where a lot of them around the country, and they might be very small, they might be very large, are saying, what are the most critical issues in our region that no one is acting on and how can we take leadership on it? And in the process of doing that, many of them have gone beyond just grant making. They're doing more convening, They've, they, they're starting to lend to nonprofits and lend to businesses and do, and, and find Look at the system in their region, find the gap, and use all the tools they have to fill that gap. And they're doing really interesting things. Yeah. Not all of them, but some of them, and it's, it's a growing movement. Uh, let me throw out a couple of data points that I bet everybody in this room either knows or has experienced, and that is that what we're finding over the last few years, that many more dollars are being given. Locally. Being given, period. Being given, period, yeah. By many fewer donors. So 20 million American families, middle class families, have dropped out of giving over the past, I think it's six years. Um, so that would suggest you know, that it's mirroring the, the um, uh, distribution of wealth, the concentration of wealth. But another point <laughs> is that many more volunteer hours are being donated by many fewer volunteers. Now, that may be because people are doing three jobs and don't have the time to volunteer. It may be an economic thing. But it may be a loss of agency. It may be a concentration of agency. And when, when I say this to philanthropists, they say, well, what do I do about it? 
you know, that, that I should worry about that, but what can I do? The only answer I've had thus far is you can give to community foundations so that they can stimulate, that they can uh, ensure robust civil society in their communities. Mm -hmm. That's what you, great big national you know, foundation with lots of money, but not necessarily ties to the community. Can, I can do, am two, I wrong? Can I give you two interesting examples yeah. of community foundations that have done things that I th consider mighty? So, um, uh, probably also about 15 years ago, there, there was um, a foundation in, in uh, South Carolina, the Coastal South Carolina Community Foundation, that covers Charleston, but also some surrounding rural counties. And they hadn't done much in rural counties, and they were challenged by a donor, in this case the Ford Foundation, when they were still funding in rural. Um, they were challenged to sort of like do more in their rural places, right? And they discovered in the process the, this issue called heirs' property. Does anyone here know what heirs' property is, right? So do you, do you oh, actually, don't, do you want to explain it? Here, give her the microphone. I will if you won't, but you go right well, ahead. Well, my basic understanding of it is that, um, so my family actually has land, but there are multiple people that have um, ownership of that land based on the number of families that are associated with that. So it becomes, it's, it's almost impossible for you to then buy it from someone else as a, as, as a property, so because you're sharing it with other heirs. Right. Get that right. So communal Very realms. good. Very good. So what, what happened is, so let's say, let's say after the Civil War, for example, you know, during Reconstruction, you know, an emancipated slave got some land, but then passed it on without a will, right? And it continued to get passed on until it gets divided among dozens of people. And it's very hard for them to come to agreement about who really owns this so we can do anything with it. But it's an asset. I mean, you look at, you know, we talked about poverty statistics. If you want to look at the division in this country in asset wealth, it's outrageous. It makes poverty look like nothing. And a lot of that has to do with land and ownership of land and, and housing. And so, so you've got this great asset, this wonderful land, which might be quite productive, some of it along coastal areas where people want to develop, do big developments and whatever. And it's easier for these families to sell it off to a development than just split the proceeds than it is to sort of clear the title and actually do something with it themselves. So the Coastal South Carolina Community Foundation realized this was an issue, and they started a project called the Center for Rural uh, for Heirs Property, which they then later spun off and now is helping African American and Native American families around the country develop clear titles so that they can use that land as an asset to build their own income and wealth. I mean, that's a pretty mighty thing. Who else was gonna analyze that problem? Who's in the business to analyze that problem, to look at the system in our region? So that's not one example. Uh, this one is really out there. In central Wisconsin, there's this community foundation called Encourage, and they're in a, they're in a place called Wisconsin Rapids in Southwood County, and they, they um, uh, paper mills closed. They've lost thousands and thousands of thousands of jobs in the last 10, 15 years. And they decided that their community foundation was gonna use all of its assets to fulfill mission of building an economy that worked for everybody, works for all. And they in, that includes their endowment. Now, like, like any university or, or foundation, whatever, you have all these, these investment managers that invest the endowment just like any of us might do our 403B or 401K for maximum return. They have figured out a way to do what they're calling, uh, I forget exa exactly what the name of it, they're, they have developed ownership in every company in Wisconsin that employs people in their place or employs a lot of people in Wisconsin. And they, they've developed all of these screens so that their entire endowment is invested in some way related to people in their region. And they're now going and acting at shareholder meetings to talk to the company about, you have to think about the community as one of your stakeholders. And we're here and we're gonna meet with you and you're gonna stop making decisions that just sort of pay no attention to the community because your company was built on this community. I, and it's it's just really interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah. So what I want to just finally turn to, and then um, have everyone engage, and that is that you you often say that you go about community to economic development in a different way, 
and that it needs to go about in a different way, and it's a, this sort of people-centered way. I, I know you don't use that language, but it's, no, it's that concept. Um, so what does that look like? How is it different? Right. So still in this country, when we say the words economic development, people think of business recruitment, right? Recruiting a business from outside the community to come in and employ people. I mean, that's still, it may not be what people in this room think, but it's still what most people think, right? And that you're recruiting businesses and then sometimes going around and trying to retain the business you have, trying to help them get ahead. But the measures are still, as I said earlier, primarily, you know, jobs, return on investment and profit and shareholder, you know, return on investment to shareholders. And the truth is most jobs, as many of you know, are created by small businesses and that businesses you already have are the ones most likely, much more likely to grow than your chances of recruiting a big business in rural America or urban really. And so what we've really focused on is sort of what really qualifies as economic development. And we say the, what you're really trying to do is look at what, if, if we look at our community, whether that's a region or one community, what do we know how to do or make? Or what could we do or make? And who wants that, right? Who wants to buy that? Who has demand for that? And what are they looking for in the quality or, 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 or sort of uh, attributes of that product or that service? Okay, once we know that, once we can document demand and know what people want, right? What can we put together here? Let's look at our system. In the value chain of activity, what do we have? And where are the gaps? And let's work on the gaps so that we can do that product and service. That's real development. So an investment goes, investment of time, treasure, and talent goes in the gaps. And you build partnerships around the gaps. And you start building a value chain of activity. And when you fill those gaps, you're starting new businesses too. So it's really, what you're trying to do at all times is create three things. One is multiple capitals. You're not just trying to create financial capital. You're trying to create intellectual capital, individual capital, which means individual skills, um, political capital, so you have more influence, cultural capital, which is quite important, uh, natural capital, which you want to preserve over time, which, you know, is the subject of a topic earlier today, because you don't want to wear it out, you know, but you need to use some of it. Um, and I might be missing one. Social capital. Social capital. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Well, you could hire so me on to you. Your you want to build all of these capitals and try not to damage any of them. So those are the things. The second thing you want to do is to increase local ownership and control of those capitals. Right? And the third thing you want to do, I mentioned earlier, you always want to make sure that low-income people, places, and firms in the region are part of the action of decision-making and part of the benefit. And we've done a lot of theory of change work on this with different groups in different sectors over the years. And what we found is if you don't ask the low income question at the design stage, it will not happen. It just won't happen. You can do everything right and not benefit the people you're most trying to do this for. You know, as if, you know, the rising tide will lift all boats, right? And the people without a boat, it won't work for, you know? And so there are boats that have to be built too. And so it's just sort of that's, those, those are the outcomes you're going for. You have to start from what you know how to do or make or what you could do or make. You have to be connected to demand. We often will just go in and say, well, we used to do this, let's do it again without finding out if the demand has changed, right? Do people want a different attribute in this product or service? But if you connect to demand, you can, you can get there. So that's the approach to development. Mm -hmm. it's, bottom, it's bottom up. It's bottom up. And so it's not just that you want to do it for, but you want to do it with. Yeah, from the, from the get-go. Now, this is a group of leaders of nonprofits from uh, across the country, but also from Nigeria and Uganda and Japan. Um, and what did I leave out? Syria. Syria. Oh my gosh, Syria! How could I, how could I forget? So, um, they, so I'm eager to hear from them, both in terms of questions to you, but also comments. What what you've seen and experience. learned in your own experience. Um, what we didn't get to was the role of, of nonprofits, but of course that's enormous uh, in, in Janet's work. So why don't you just sort of stick up a hand and, and Ashby will get to you. Let's get over to uh, Abbas. 
And Abbasis is from Uganda. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Abbas. I'm from Uganda, Kampala. But I also come from a village. <coughs> it's um, five hours out of Kampala. That's where my mother comes from. So one of the biggest challenges that I know is media <coughs> in terms of telling rural stories. So the media concentration, for example, in Uganda is in the urban areas. In the rural communities, maybe urban cities, you have community radios. Mm. I wonder if you have the same concept here in America and how it works. Yeah, I mean, you raise something very important because at, at the same time that we have had restructuring of things like the paper industry, the timber industry, manufacturing, agriculture, we've had a restructuring of journalism, especially print journalism in this country, but not only print journalism. So we have, in the same way that rural hospitals are closing, we have a lot of rural newspapers closing. And there's been a lot of work on how do we share information. And the other thing is the national newspapers, uh, even the local newspapers that exist, they're getting feeds from national, there's very little local reporting. So how are people getting their information? They're getting it from the television, from national news, and there aren't that many local news stations. So we have a real issue here. And there are certainly some efforts to develop community journalism or different ways of spreading information in communities, but we've, we've, got, a, we've got a serious issue on that right now. And the, the other problem is the national media is still primarily, I don't want to say all, but primarily you know, zeroed in on this, what's wrong in rural, and why did some people there vote for certain candidates? You know, And they'll, they'll run into a rural community and try to find the person who's going to talk about that, as opposed to say, is this whole community like that, or let's get some. So it's perpetuating myths. So what, are, is there community radio? Yes. Is there community journalism? Yes. But there's not, not enough. There is a move in this country, though, and I'm sure you're aware of it, towards some solutions journalism now, where there, there's more movement towards how are we writing stories about solutions as opposed to about problems. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's happening in rural. There are some national uh, efforts, uh, I, some curated national uh, outlets for news like the Daily Yonder and things like that that are really interesting that are trying to amalgamate stories from elsewhere. Um, but we have a real issue on that. Okay. I'm, I, I'm the coordinator for solutions. I figured. <laughs> it, it wasn't written in your thing, but I, I said that's a solutions journalism guy. <laughs> Next. This is unlike you. Yes. You twitched at the right moment. I saw it. Um, I had two questions. Was one it actually was spurred from you, Jane, when you said donations are down recently? But I wonder how that data is analyzed because I think about my traditional giving is down, but my GoFundMe stuff is up, mm -hmm. right? And so I get things like cash at me. I'm raising money yep. for a family that's going to lose their home, or you know, like. So I was just wondering, yeah. has so, it gone down or has it shifted? Or families gone. are, so if I just calculate the money I've helped with my brother, right? It's not making it on your report. That's I've, not catch. That's yeah. not caught. But it's but, increased as families experience different things. Right. But it's never been caught. So, so if I say it's up or down, that still stays, right? That's always been on the outside, the, okay. the family giving. But, but um, I didn't say don't, I, I said the number of givers has gone down. The amount of money given has gone up. But you would think that the GoFundMe and and Giving Tuesday uh, and just giving over you know uh, social media more generally um, would would maybe make up for the loss of, of other types of giving. It has it it has not. So I've given you the net, including uh, the online giving. And this is gifts to all nonprofits and foundations. What is it what, giving to? Oh, it, you know, any, any place where philanthropy is given, but it's not helping out your friend or your cousin. It's not what doesn't get registered in some way. So you pass money around to your friends, or, I mean, as you know, throughout our history, in relative terms, the poor have given way more than the wealthy, right? 
and as a that, percentage of income, definitely. as a percentage of income, um, and really they're, they're close to the problem. They see the problem. They act on the problem, um, and that has always been hard to capture. Also, um, but but it, it is no different today than it was six years ago. And those are the that's it, it, what we gather isn't different, um, and uh, and so those those are net numbers, and they're very concerning. My second question is river related. So I work for a city municipality and we are trying to return the rapids in our name. <laughs> um, so we're restoring the rapids. We had some dams put in. Um, and so the conversation around, you know, who's going to own the businesses on the banks? How do we make sure that micro local businesses are getting some of this $90 million for reconstruction of this river? But you just spurred something and it's like, okay, we're talking about the section that's in the city. I haven't heard any conversations for the, the rural community upstream or downstream. Have you seen a city who is doing maybe a similar project or something similar that you, I could glean a practice that I can embed as we're in the early stages to include the rural aspect of it? Mm -hmm. You know, you might want to um, look at, there was, there's a, there was a, a group of foundations focused on the Mississippi River a number of years ago that was coordinated by the Funders, Net, uh, Funders Network for Smart Growth and Livable Communities. And my guess is they ran into that. And I, I would I would talk to them. I can I can give you a better thing on that. But um, you know, I, you raise something that that I think is important to say about rural. That I mean, you're you're sort of saying so we're in the center, and now I realize we have these outlying areas, and we all have something to do with each other. And maybe we should talk about this. Maybe yeah, <laughs> which is good. But I mean, you know, it's it's. Um, so let me get a little Michigan centric here now. One of the, one of the things about rural. You should do that. One of the things about rural is, I mean, you know, so you have regions, right? So if you've got a city or a metropolitan area, you've got a city government, right? Or in the suburban governments, often there's a council of governments, and when there's a metro wide thing, they'll sit down and get together <laughs> and have arguments, but they will sit down and get together. But so if rural people will often say, you ask a rural person where they're from. And try this sometime, because when I ask rural people where they're from, they very rarely say the name of their town. They say, well, I'm from the valley, or I'm from the, or I'm from, you know, they, they, you know I, have to, I have to ask them three times to get the actual name of the town. And I've never quite understood this, but it's interesting. Whereas I have the other example where I say from Detroit, people say, which suburb? And I say, no, I'm from Detroit. Well, which suburb? And I say, the city, <laughs> right? So I, have the, I answer it right, and people keep trying to get me to give them another answer with rural, it's the other way around. But, but so here, here, so in Michigan, those of you who don't know, Michigan has two peninsulas. The lower peninsula is, faced like, is shaped like a mitten, and the upper peninsula sort of looks like this, right? There's a bridge between them. And, and, you know, the lower, I'll just go to the lower peninsula now. There's this thing. It's called the thumb, right? People say, I'm from the thumb, right? There are hundreds of jurisdictions in the thumb and places. But they recognize as a thumb. And that the people who live in the thumb have common opportunities, common environment, common problems. But there's no government of the thumb. So who can make decisions for the thumb, right? Who can bring together people to say, we have common cause, in the same way you're talking about doing it as a city, you can bring your suburbs together, it's pretty easy, or your outlying areas. But who can bring together a rural region to make decisions for itself? And where are the assets, the revenues? Some of those little governments may have a little bit of tax revenue, but they've got to spend it on their water system or on their police. They don't have, like, and some of them don't even have any taxing authority. So how do you amass resources that the thumb can invest in itself? Right? And that's why rural nonprofits are really important. Whether they're community foundations or community development financial institutions, or they might be the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, it can be very different in different places. A United Way or a community action agency. Who it is, and I'm sure in other nations it's the same thing. You know, you'll find over in this part of your country, there's this one rural nonprofit that looks very unlike this one, but in their places, they're, they're the actor, they're the hub. The little report I handed out is we've just done a study talking to 43 
you know, very innovative rural development organizations in this country that we think are hubs because they take on each other's aspects. They start developing the tools as an organization they need to get the work done. They're not the government, but they're the gathering place. They're the actors for the thumb. So, but we don't think about that in urban either. Yeah. Yeah. We've got folks here who are from countries where the civic space is not as deep, not, not as, as much um, civil society organization. So I'm gonna, I am going to ask you to say something about Nigeria and then turn to China. Uh, so go ahead. Fidelis. Hi, my name is Fidelis Bonaventure Uzoma. I'm from Isi Alamba, no local government, Okai village, and that's in East Nigeria. But I lived and grew up in Ibadan. And in Ibadan, there's a place they call Agbowu. Agbowu is the community where I work. And in that community, there are about, excuse me, there are about So in the whole of Ibadan, there is about 25,000 young people who are very vulnerable. But from that 25,000, we have 15,000 who are young persons with disabilities. Now, and I want to get the fact right so that I don't mix the, the I don't want to you know, create a disservice to them. But I work specifically with about 5,000 persons with mobility disabilities. And it's hard to work effectively with 50. Do you have strategies on how best to leverage on resource mobilization, asset mapping, you know, things that can help me get the work done to get to these people? The 50 I work with, yes, we can only try, but my goal is to reach the 5,000. Do you have yeah. help? Yeah. Thank you. That, I mean, obviously that's a longer conversation. But, you know, let me say a couple things. You know, one, one thing is that any, uh, I mean, in this nation as well, we have a lot of what we call, n not all mobility um, challenged, but opportunity youth, right? Who are youth between the ages of 16 and 24 who are neither in school nor have a job. And the percentage of those is higher in rural than in urban America as well, which a lot of people don't think about. And a lot of them are young parents, which means they have children that are gonna grow up in, in a deprivation as well, or in a challenging situation. The, the most important thing is to work with them to understand what they believe their challenges are. That's the most important thing. And then mobilizing resources around those challenges because the, the humans tendered in design piece, and we have another program at, at the Institute called Ascend, which is having another meeting on the other side of campus, that focuses on two or multi-generation approaches to combat family poverty. And what they've learned is, and this is another issue we have in rural and urban in all of America, we silo programs for people so that you know, you get your fuel assistance here, your food help here, your education there, and oh, some for your kid over there. And we saddle people with having to navigate these wonderful systems of services we are providing for them before we talk to them about what their real barriers are. I mean, you told me at lunch about your amazing friend who is totally paralyzed. You know, we, we had this conversation at lunch, totally paralyzed from the head down. And if she, you, you asked her if you, if you had it to do over again, what would you change? And she said, I wouldn't change anything because I think I'm happy, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. What she perceives as a challenge is probably different than what someone just looking at her would perceive as a challenge. And so the most important thing for us as responsible nonprofits trying to help people get ahead in the economy is to have them advise us. Mm -hmm. They are experts in their own lives. We are not. And, and the most important, one of the most important things I heard from uh, one of the families working with Ascend was, meet me where I dream. Mm -hmm. 
not, don't meet me at my need, meet me at my dream, right? And that is, so, you know, you can mobilize resources when the voice of the people is heard, and, but you've got to listen to the voice yourself first and bring their powerful voices to the table to help people understand, who, people who have the resources to understand that they are an underutilized resource. That's the other thing about true development. It's about bringing underutilized resources into happy production <laughs> in society. And we have a lot of underutilized resources that, who are people. Right? That's the best advice I can give you without knowing a heck of a lot more. Amen. grew up in China, so um, I, uh, I'm still uh, learning the American politics. I just didn't grow up being used to participate. You probably know voting. more about American politics than a lot of us do. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, it, yeah, I find it confusing, um, mm. and, uh, but, um, so I have two, two kind of different questions. One is um, the uh, uh, the rural population overall in America. Um, are they are they more red or more blue overall? Is that a too naive a question? That's one. And and either either answer you know why it, it may be mm -hmm. it's blue or red. And the second question is. Um, uh, a different question is that sometimes when I share with other nonprofit organizations about serve, uh, serving rural communities, one thing that always comes up is that there isn't enough population there and uh, it costs 10 times more. Uh, you, th that, that, um, so I see many nonprofits don't go there. And so I'm wondering that uh, and you talked about developing the rural community from within the rural community, and um, does it make, you know, does it make sense for organizations to provide direct service to the rural communities from outside that community, or they really should be building within the community to be more sustainable? Yeah, I think, and I, I didn't draw this line, uh, this circle back, and let me do that. When I talked about what we think of as the job of economic development here, we have a lot of people in this country, for example, who do economic development. And they're mainly focused public resources, our tax dollars, on business recruitment and business attraction, especially attraction, and a lot of money. We, New York Times, I think $80 billion in one year was focused on business attraction. And trust me, it didn't attract enough business to justify that $80 billion. If we took half of that, and redistribute it to economic people doing economic development to do what I talked about, which is to sort of say, what can we do or make here? What could we do or make here? To really analyze the system and figure out what we can grow from within, we'd probably have some really good successes. But we don't do it. So in other words, I'm sort of saying we already have people doing economic development who are doing a job that is not truly economic development. It's business attraction, right? And so, if we redefined the job, and if we as a nation embraced what the real outcome should be, which is building the capitals, local ownership control, and low income people, places, and firms getting ahead, and we said, this is what we're gonna measure you by, we would change that job and change the position. We don't train people in our colleges and universities to do that. We train them to do something else. So we haven't made the profession what it could be. So I, so I think, actually, we have a lot of people, even com county commissioners and whatever, who if they had a different mindset, might do a lot of different things with the resources they already have. Not that more resources wouldn't be welcome. So I, that's how I would approach your second question. The first question on, is rural America more red than, than blue? It depends on which part of rural America. There is no one rural America. So I could take you to Brownsville, Texas, where it's more blue, and I could take you to, you know, or Nebraska, where it's more red. I mean, it just depends on where you are. Was there a larger red vote in the last presidential election for the Republican candidate than there was in the election prior to that? Yes. 
Will there be in the next one? I don't know. And that so, was a powerful vote for change, which right. may be the common thread you'll see. But a lot of people, so to your confusion, a lot of people in this country think that the result of the prior election was primarily due to rural voters or, or attributed to rural voters. It's not true. Uh, suburban women voters were uh, a big uh, cohort. A lot of young people who did not vote, who voted in the prior election, mm -hmm. were also another cohort. That, so there are many different things that change outcomes. But a lot of it because there was a surge of support for uh, President Trump, at that point candidate Trump, in rural America that was noticeable, there wasn't a lot of analysis done about the rest of the vote that, that became popular, right? But there's plenty of other analysis. So uh, what will be in the next election? We don't know. Because there's also these independent swing voters that are neither red nor blue. And they're the ones that really swayed the election one way or another. And so the real fight is for those, those folks, right? And a lot of voters, uh, not just in rural, that voted blue before and voted red the next time. And they move. They move. So, you know, does that help or are you, are you more confused? <laughs> Anyone can disagree, by the way. There's other people here may have a different analysis. I appreciate the Okay. Oh, Megan. This is a related question. Um, so to what extent is the Electoral College contributing to some of the myth and confusion and tension between rural and urban America? And what would be the impact on rural America or what is the impact of potentially abolishing the Electoral College? Or is that even a conversation that's happening in rural America? Did you have any readings on the democratic republic that we are? Not just the democracy, but the republic? about the republic, just say no. Yeah, okay. I mean, we're a representative democracy. Yeah, I know. Right. So. Um, <laughs> Representing capital. Is there, is, so. there a, is there a discussion about it in rural America? I imagine somewhere there is, just as there is in urban America, um, what would, so what you, you asked, what would the impact be uh, of what, of changing it? Yeah. Uh, well, straight if you changed vote. it, you'd have a straight popular vote and uh, we would have had a different winner in the last election. Okay. That's the answer to that question. Okay. But is it likely to change? I doubt it. I mean, yeah, you know. Yeah, the, so what's the view and what's the conversation, if any? I don't, I, I, I haven't been in a conversation in rural America okay. about the Electoral College. I'm just being quite honest with you. But it, I avoid talking about politics when I go and do my work because okay. I'm always working with people from different parties and our work is not about politics. Our work is about improving the community. Right. It's not that I don't like talking about it. And one of my best friends is a political pollster and I talk about it all the time. But you're asking is, is there a discussion? And I think to the extent there's a discussion, it's let's not change it. I mean, I for the same reason that people don't want to, uh, you know, there, there are two senators for every state, including the, the rural states that have only one person in the House of Representatives. But that, that was a check and balance. So that there is some representation of rural America in U.S. Congress. So I, I, yeah, uh, so I would guess that the conversation about that is, is where the concentrations of populations are greatest. Um, that that you, you hear folks who would like to do away with the Electoral College. Right. Yes, got a microphone coming your way. Hi, um, Katrina Breeze. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, since manufacturing is, um, you know, relatively speaking, the largest industry in rural America, how has that changed over the past 30 years? And um, if it has changed, what impact has that had in philanthropy in those rural communities? Well, there are lots of different ones. Um, I would say that there, there has been, a, there was a decline in manufacturing like 30 years ago. That, the decline was still happening. Um, we now have some onshoring happening, right? Because the, the cost of, of transportation of goods has become more expensive, um, especially when people want things just in time. So that's caused some of it. Uh, we've looked better as a place for manufacturing in terms of price compared to some other places. The current trade policy is sort of 
affecting that right now? Because I, we do a lot of work with people who are doing, uh, you know, development in rural places that have manufacturing bases like Appalachian, Ohio, who say they have companies that, that actually do want to establish a concern in the U.S., but they won't do it without sort of, because things are so unpredictable in terms of price, tariffs, and all that kind of stuff. So there's that issue. There's been a lot of consolidation. The other thing I would say, there's been a lot of, there's a lot of ownership of manufacturing that is now in other countries. And this is an ownership issue. That's why Wisconsin Rapids has gone to the, the shareholder, um, um, the shareholder uh, movement because they, they used to have all these locally owned companies that were very beneficent. And when the paper mill got sold off to this company and then to an international concern and then to private equity, you know, sort of owners have no interest in the community. And so there's a big issue right now building about who owns rural America. And there's a lot of ownership of rural America that's not in the United States. And it's growing. And that includes manufacturing because manufacturing is one of the most you know, it's a more productive and lucrative, you know, if you're making good products. So, so there are some places that are really growing their manufacturing base uh, and jobs, and there are others that never really were manufacturing. So, but there's, there's some good news. I don't know if that's helpful to you or not. It is. I, I also know that so many um, companies that are based in, whether they're based in rural communities or in urban communities, are um, make it a point to invest in their own backyard and I don't know if the change. Oh, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that I can. I could tell you stories of some that are very investing, very much. I mean, in West Central Minnesota, in parts of Minnesota, there are these wonderful local foundations called initiative foundations that have worked really hard to analyze what their manufacturers need. And you know, there's a his wonderful historic story where. In West Central Minnesota, they had a lot of small manufacturers, but they weren't growing. And they went around and talked to them all. Once again, human-centered design. They went around and talked to them all. What do you need to get ahead? And they, they said, well, we need this new technology. But it wouldn't. But we can't get the right loan capital to get it. And even if we did, it wouldn't matter because we don't have people who are skilled enough to do it, to use it. So this foundation went around and figured out what the funding gap was and developed a loan product that would unleash some of the local banks, right? So they did the gap loan, the subordinated gap loan, so that the local banks would lend so they could buy the new machine or technology. And then the community foundation made partnerships with local colleges from around the region and the state manufacturing extension service to retrain the workforce and got the companies to pay the workers while they're being retrained on site. And over the course of 20 years, their wages have gone up. Uh, during the recession, they laid nobody off. They now have thousands more manufacturing jobs, et cetera, et cetera. I can go on. I've got whole slideshows on this. And there, there are other ones. This is not the only story I have. The point being, they looked at the system. What do we know how to do or make? What are people looking for? You know, talk to the locals. What's keeping you from getting ahead? And then put together the package of activity and partners that will make it work and get to documented demand. So there, there are stories like that. The question is, who's doing that analysis work? Whose job is that? And that's it. We don't have enough people with that job. So we have time for just one more question or comment. So Mako. Hi, I'm Mako. I came from Japan mm -hmm. thanks to American Express Leadership Academy in Tokyo. And we already have 800 alumni uh, happening in Tokyo. And having met so many nonprofit leaders, young and old, I'm very much concerned about their mental health and physical health. Because yeah. I hear so many stories about like burning out, burnout. And there's uh, so many people are beginning to be aware of the importance of um, self-care, self-management, uh, mindfulness. So I would like to hear your thought about the leader's mental health from the viewpoint of leadership development. Yeah. In, do you, in think rural she, do you really think she should be asking me? <laughs> 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 Why do you think she and I watch, you know, the, the voice. voice and talk to each other? 
I, I mean, that's why in my little bio I say in my spare time I unashamedly watch TV and I sing and do anything I can to get my brain away. I know you weren't asking about me, <laughs> but thank you anyway. Uh, but um, I think I don't, I don't know how to answer you because I don't think there's a lot of focus on this. The most important thing, in my view, is for boards of directors of nonprofits to understand this. And there are several things that boards can do. They can, you know, require that more people get hired and raise the money to fund it <laughs> in some way or help to do that. Um, they can bring in people to help executives, because most people running nonprofits were not trained to run an organization. They were not trained as accountants. They weren't trained as fundraisers. They weren't trained. They, they come into their nonprofit leadership with content knowledge or passion yeah. and commitment, not with training to run an organization the way businesses run organizations and nonprofits are businesses. I've had no training. You know, it, you know there's a lot of back of the envelope, right? Because programs at Aspen raise their own money too, just like you guys do. And so it, it's... So I, so I think boards can do that. Boards can also sort of recognize burnout and like say, you need a sabbatical, <laughs> you know? I, I, I've never understood why people at universities get sabbaticals, but people running nonprofits don't, right? I, no, 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 you know, no disrespect. No disrespect, why, why is it? I said, of course not. Of course not, <laughs> right. And I know you work hard, you know? But there's something else here, and this might make uh, the yeah. uh, academy nonprofit sector distinction. Oops. Uh, sorry. Oh, you can't do that. <laughs> I'm tethered. Yeah. Here you go. So I, I think possibly the difference that you're focusing on between the academy and, and the nonprofit sector stems from the work we're doing. Uh, and that is to say, that you have to write books. recognizing that that the universities are the non nonprofits for the most part. It's yeah, the two that we work for. They are. Uh, but that that the work that people in the nonprofits are represented by the people in this room, they are faced with challenges, s significant challenges and constant challenges. And so the the burnout to which you're referring, Mako, comes in part from the challenges that the nonprofit leaders face. And you could argue that as, as faculty, we have a great life. The truth is, of course, that we face challenges that relate to the challenges that people in this room from the nonprofit sector yes. face. And uh, facing those challenges has, in some ways, the same effects on us. But yes, we do theoretically have our summers off, and maybe that helps, right? No. OK. But, but yeah. I think this question of what kinds of challenges do you face, and how does that impact your mental health, that matters. Yeah, I think there's one other distinction is that, now now I understand that in, in academia you also have to raise funds and you also have to do things and if you go into administration you have to do things you weren't trained for, but you were trained for your discipline. And a lot of nonprofit people were not trained to run organizations and that becomes part of their discipline whether they like it or not. And so there's that on top. The other thing is you do get sabbaticals, and they don't. <laughs> so, so, so let me so just add. I, I'm all for the sabbatical. Don't get me wrong. So I, I mean, let me just add that we're, we're measured by different metrics, and you have to write books. We don't. Uh, so you have to take uh, three really? to six months. Well, of course we do, actually. <laughs> but it's not, it, it's, not, it's not always a requirement of, of your work, and research is almost invariably a requirement of, a, of an academic. And mm -hmm. there you want them to go off for for a period of time to do that work. Right, I mean the other thing I would say here to this question of are you trained to do the work you do in the nonprofit sector, we see increasing, so I'm speaking coming out of Sloan, right, so business school, we see increasing numbers of young people who uh, come from the nonprofit sector and in many cases plan to go back to the nonprofit right. sector right. who Go are to there to school. study what we talked about with Tuckville this morning, the science of association. And we recognize that, so Tim specifically, uh, right, as, as management, getting training and management, because that's going to make the difference. That's going to begin to make the difference. I mean, yeah, and, and I don't, I still don't think that's a huge, I don't, I, MIT is special because they started there. Princeton did that too. I mean, a, a number of them have done it, but I don't think Stanford. it's widespread yet. Right. So uh, one last, okay, now we've got questions at the end. It's, can you pass that, Abbas, can you pass that behind you? 
I just, I just had a contribution to that. Okay, oh. real quick, but we've got two. Okay, so. Uh, no, let him let him speak. Go ahead and say it. It's on that topic. Um, yes. So personally, I but think. But then to Maria. Personally, uh, I'm perfect. I think victim of starting in a, an organization from no experience at all, out of passion. But I've also realized because of the little success that I've made so far, it has also come with a lot of pressure, which builds expectation either in the community, in the family, amongst friends. And that brings anxiety and depression. So what, yeah. <coughs> what I've started is to mobilize young CEOs and young founders in, 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 in Kampala to come together to just like rant out our challenges and share like what are you going through and, and see if we can build like if I'm having challenges of budgeting and things like that, maybe there's someone else that is doing that. So if you have 800 alumni, maybe you can start a network from that space as well to just talk through it. So because we actually yeah. are out of time, we're gonna take the next two comments or questions, so Maria and Well, Vier. just quickly around the, the burnout. I, I mean, I think I've worked in nonprofits my, almost my entire adult life, but I think there is, um, it's a structural issue and it's not just because we're, we're not trained as, uh, I mean, in that, there are many cases around that, but a lot of it is there's a culture and there's a, there's a, a you know, a scarcity mentality, honestly. And so, and the problems are so big and we're so small <laughs> that there's something that's really wrong with the system. So, yeah. just want to share. And then a beer, real quick, and then we're gonna, no, to pass it forward, thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Abir, and I worked in the nonprofit sector in Syria for uh, four years. I worked in direct service. So I think many things tied to the burnout. First of all, the, the limited tools and training you have versus your responsibilities is one of them. But I wanted to also comment on people uh, trying to get to business school or like some of these technical degrees to do something about their nonprofit or contribute back to the nonprofit sector. I was actually warned about this because I'm considering applying f to law school. Uh, a lot of people are imagining that I would go for something like human rights law and stuff like that that relate to my past and my career past. Um, but I was, I was told that a lot of people go to business schools or, or law school or um, or some of these technical schools, but then they get hit by the bill, they need to pay for that education, and they're like, okay, so do I invest the same degree that could get me to the for-profit sector and get rid of my financial you know, burdens, or do I get back to the nonprofit sector? So the, 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 sometimes the payment of people is not very high in the nonprofit sector, also the growth your um, opportunity to grow from your position that you enter in the nonprofit to higher positions is really limited. Sometimes you move up twice and that's it. That will be the ceiling of your growth, so. There, there are a lot of reasons. I think there, there, there's one other thing, and, and I'll end quickly, that a lot of nonprofits have to run on year-to-year -year money and raise that money constantly, and they don't get general support now there's a real trend towards project support and constant deliverables. Mm -hmm. So there's no thinking time, there's no strategizing time, there's no, there isn't funding for that sufficient compared to 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, where foundations would give nonprofits sort of more general support so you could really build a team over time too. It's hard to build a succession team with project money, very hard. So that I think also contributes. So. It's an issue, you're right, there are lots of different approaches to it, but there are some structural pieces of it that need some big thinking, I think. Let me, let me just close on, on this last question, and thank you for asking it. Um, I, I think Maria's really right that culture mm -hmm. trumps all else in this. Uh, when it comes to purpose-driven work, there's a tendency to hold oneself to a much higher standard because, in part because there's so many diffuse metrics and you're trying to reach them all. But a lot of it is sort of a deep uh, tendency to believe um, that working all the time is appropriate 
and that giving yourself a break is inappropriate, that it's self-indulgent uh, and not something. So it's very culturally, I think, driven. Um, the only other places where I've seen a non, I've spent my whole life either in government or in nonprofits or foundations. And the only other places where I've seen that culture, uh, when it's the private sector, it's startups. Uh, and when it's the public sector, it's the White House. It's a place where you are under, you know, because our government was not set up to have all the policy come from the White House or any of the execution come from the White House. So it's not staffed for that. So it's a situation in which you're asking fewer people to achieve more with very diffuse metrics. But those are the only places I've seen it um, in, in other sectors. So it's culture, it's up to us, and it's one of the reasons we're so enthusiastic about this partnership with, with, with American Express, is because it's forcing you guys <laughs> away from your inbox for only a week. It's less than a week. I wish it were longer. Um, but if you, you know, if you have only a week to give, you know, be in a situation where you're A, developing a network of people who are going through exactly what you're going through, but from a different place. Um, but B, you're exploring your values, which you don't have any time for otherwise, because it's all about execution. Um, and then three, the reading and the talking you're doing is unlike anything you're doing in the office. So you're forced to feel differently, to think differently, and to open yourself up. So Richard, this is why it matters so much to us to do this. This is a big part of what you do. I mean, we're, we're only a small piece of that agenda. Um, but that is the answer to, to your question, I think, is breaks that are foisted upon you by a, by a funder or a board, because uh, you're not going to take them otherwise. Anyway, so Elena, say the last words, and we will stop. I just want to share this information. In Arizona, in Arizona there is a foundation that funds um, executive director sabbatical mm -hmm. it, from nonprofit sector. So, okay. Okay, thanks so much. I'm sorry this room was so hot. You're all good at Fanny. Thank you, Janet. Thanks.